Hey everyone, so welcome to chapter 7, uh, and to just start off, um, it deals with autonomous systems and stability, and so just as a quick recap from, I think it was early on, chapter 2, yeah, I think it was chapter 2.6, where we covered autonomous. Um, essentially, we're going to now do systems, so dx dt is equal to some function f that's only a function of x and y. And then dy dt is equal to g, and it's only a function strictly of x or y. Um, and so this is autonomous because both of the right-hand sides do not depend on time, which is the only criteria that we need. And so now to make things more interesting, we want to now shift and focus on nonlinear systems. And so to preface this, I want to go ahead and start off that the overall theme of this chapter, and this is going to apply if you decide to do more advanced differential equations, um, if you want to take the more advanced classes at Georgia Tech or the graduate level courses, uh, you're going to notice that pretty much all of the nonlinear ODEs are too difficult to arrive at any um, easy analytical answer, uh, to put it bluntly. And so therefore, what we need to do now is just employ what we have learned in chapters 3 and 6 with relatively low effort. And not to give too much away, but that basically means we're going to try to make these nonlinear systems as linear as possible. Which, if you're an engineering student, I can promise you that at least one, two, maybe all of your classes are going to do something like this. Um, you know, it plays to the stereotype that we that we estimate too much and that we don't arrive at exact answers, but the truth is that the real world is not is not perfect, right? We need to be able to approximate and know within what range our answers are uh, are usable and where they're, you know, pseudo-correct. Um, so this is kind of your introduction to that. So if you're an engineer especially, this chapter overall is going to help you really understand what lies ahead for you. Which is very exciting. So, but before that, let's review stability. So, stability now instead of just having numbers, we have uh, systems, right? So it's vector x prime is equal to f of x, and so critical points are clearly where f of some critical point x naught is equal to zero. And just as before, critical points can either be unstable, stable, or asymptotically stable. They're stable if the solution x of t stays close to that critical point x naught for all t greater than zero. It's asymptotically stable if it holds that same definition for stability, so x of t has to stay close to it for all t greater than zero, and the limit as t approaches infinity of your solution must be x zero. So that's the main distinction between asymptotically uh, stable, and for this class it's okay to say that asymptotically uh, asymptotic stability is kind of like a stronger version of stability. And then finally, unstable is if x of t leaves the vicinity of x naught. So fairly straightforward. Now to illustrate this further, um, let's bring in a physical model. And the one that I've chosen is the oscillating pendulum, which is pretty, uh, pretty traditional when you start off with this. And so I'll draw it for you. What this means is, so you have a roof, right? You have some string and then you have some mass, right, some mass m. And then if you draw these dotted lines down to here, this angle right here you call theta. Uh, the length of the string is L. You have a dampening force on the mass itself, which is given as C d theta dt, where C is, you know, just some arbitrary constant. Or not, sorry, not arbitrary constant, it's, a, it's just a constant that relates, um, you know, the, it's basically like the damping constant from the mass oscillator problem. Uh, if you need this any further, this distance right here is L sine theta. Um, obviously, force of gravity is mg, right? And then the distance from here to down here is L1 minus cosine theta. Okay, and basically we're modeling as this pendulum, you know, swings uh, back and forth, uh, hanging from the roof, right? And so, all this physics aside, I'm going to kind of hand wave um, to get to the more important parts. You can arrive at this equation, 
which will model this given that let's see gamma is equal to very bad equal sign sorry oh gosh that always happens let's see so given that gamma is equal to c okay okay whatever i'm gonna roll with it m times l and uh, then omega squared is given as g over l. Hopefully you've seen this in physics before, physics 1. Um, but anyway, you can translate, because this is a second order uh, differential equation, you can translate it into, uh, into a system of two first order, right, of dx dt and dy dt. So in order to do this translation, to, to go from here to here, all you need is that x is equal to theta, and then y is equal to d theta dt, which um, was the the substitution that we made always. And so clearly, now if we want to find critical uh, critical points, it means that both dy dt and dx dt have to both equal zero at the same time, right? So that means simultaneously the equations must be equal to zero. So for dx dt, this can only happen when y is equal to 0, which then means that for dy dt, if y is equal to 0, then minus omega squared sine x has to equal to 0. Omega squared is never going to be 0, because gravity is never going to be 0 in whatever environment we're trying to model this in. Therefore, sine of x itself has to be 0. Sine of x on the unit circle is only 0 at plus or minus n pi. And so that's that's clearly where this happens. So it's at x is equal to plus or minus n pi, where n is an integer, right? Okay, good. So that's great. We should circle this. This is our uh, critical points thus far. Wow, that's terrible. Wow, why is it doing this? Okay, uh, let me fix that real quick. Okay, great. So. Um, now let's look at visually what do these critical points mean actually like why what about these points in the physical model um, does it does it correspond to like a certain stability you know so uh, I might not have been clear on this but we're going to pretend that the roof that the, the ball can go over the roof so it's kind of more of like a pivot um Anyway, I'll draw it real quick and you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about. So y equals 0 and then x equals plus or minus n pi it corresponds to the two only possible uh, equilibrium critical points, which is going to be the point where the string is vertically up and the mass is right here, or to the point where the string is vertically down and the mass is down here. Now, uh, you let's say you know nothing about differential equations. Which one of these looks unstable to you, just based on physical intuition? Hopefully, you think that this one is the unstable one, because if you know, like any perturbation that you act upon when it's all the way up there, is going to cause it to to go away from there. So it's never going to really go back to that uh, to that point and it's going to want to get away from it with you know even the, the slightest little gush of wind that comes near the ball or mass or whatever it may be right which means that this bottom one what would you think it is you your choices are asymptotically stable or stable and at that point you ask yourself okay we have a dampening factor of gamma therefore eventually as time equals to zero the dampening force is going to cause this thing to go to some sort of rest position therefore here this position is asymptotically stable. Good. All right. Now, we need to consider the fact if, what if gamma is equal to zero? If gamma is equal to zero, then any sort of push or pull on that mass when it's in the bottom position is going to cause it to oscillate indefinitely, right? Because if gamma is equal to zero, when you solve the second order equation or whatever, you're going to get sinusoids without any uh, decaying exponential attached to them, right? 
which means that the limit as c approaches infinity, you can't say it goes to zero, or aka the rest position. Therefore, that would be the case in where uh, you have a stable, but not asymptotically stable, critical point. Now, uh, you've heard me say critical points a lot during this video, and so how are we going to find these just in general? Because that was a very, um, you know, it seemed like a pretty easy method of just figuring it out, and also the equations weren't too bad. But as you come across these problems, how what is the surefire way to make sure you get all of them? And so I'll show you what I do. And uh, hopefully, I mean, it hasn't done me wrong thus far, so hopefully it'll work for you as well. And so basically what it comes down to is realizing that uh, zero times anything is equal to zero. That's the main argument of my, of my method. So what happens is, okay, you take a look at this x, right? And you look at y prime now. So what happens is, so let me actually rewrite this so it's a little bit bigger so I can more clearly demonstrate to you what I'm trying to do. And I'm putting in some spaces for, for you'll, you'll see, it'll become very obvious in a second. Right? So it's the same thing. So here's what I do. It's already factored nicely, which is good. So I'm going to say that these two are my first case. And then x attached to that second term is my second case. And then I do the exact same thing for the next factor. So this 2 minus x minus y attached to the 1 minus y is my third case. And then this fourth one is just my 2 minus x minus y attached to my 2 plus x is my fourth case. And now you just ask yourself, okay, x, so in the top one, I'm saying x has to equal to 0, and 1 minus y has to equal to 0. These equal signs are just not having it at all. It might just be I, I can't lift my pen that much. I'm not sure. Um, so the way that this happens is, okay, clearly... If you solve these both simultaneously, then z x has to equal 0, and then y has to equal 1. Therefore, that's your first critical point. That's good. Okay. Case 2 is, what did I say? x equals to 0. Let me put a 2 over here. x equals to 0, and 2 plus x equals to 0. Now, this can't happen, right? In the top one, x has to equal to 0, but if it equals to 0, then in the bottom one, 2 is equal to 0. It does not make sense. Therefore, and this is perfectly okay, you're not going to have a critical point for every scenario that you test, and that's fine. You just need to make sure that you test all your, cover all your bases, right? And so, now, moving on to, let's say, case 3. I'm sorry you can't see it. Hopefully you've written it down. Um... But anyway, and actually, let me make sure I get it right. Okay, case 3 is my 2 minus x. Oh, okay, you can see it. Never mind. 2 minus x minus y is going to equal to 0. And then 1 minus y is going to equal to 0. Okay, clearly, y has to equal 1, right, in the bottom equation. And then that means that x has to equal 1 in the top equation. So that's your second critical point. That's good. And then my last one is those last two factors associated with each other, which is going to be case 4 of 2 minus x minus y is equal to 0, and then 2 plus x is equal to 0. Now, clearly, from the bottom one, x has to equal minus 2, and then if x equals minus 2, then 2 minus minus 2 is going to give you 4, which means y has to equal 4. And there we go. You found the three possible critical points for this system. Now, next time we're going to see what we do with these critical points um, in order to, to draw a rough um, nonlinear phase portrait, which is, uh, they're actually very cool looking, very pretty pictures. Um, if you don't consider sometimes how hard they can be to get to them, or, I mean, all the prettier, right, with uh, all the pain and effort that you have to go through, I guess. But uh, yeah, I'll see you soon.